like to invite you to turn with the Bible to Matthew chapter 1. Last week we looked at John's narrative of Christ's entrance into the world. This morning I want to turn our attention to the first gospel in the order we find it in our scripture, the gospel of Matthew chapter 1. Teresa came across a cartoon that really made me laugh this week. I hope you appreciate it as much as I did. It's a picture of a Christmas stocking full of candy, having a conversation with a pinata. (laughs) And the Christmas stocking says to pinata, there isn't anything worse in this world than to be stuffed with candy and hung on a mantle. That's all it says. Pinata is a little burrow, and his eyes are about this big. Like, let me tell you, what could be worse? I don't know about you, but I, I thought of this as kind of a picture of the way life feels sometimes. We stuff ourselves with all of these things that look good and they don't satisfy. And then, if you, were, if you will, we're hung over a fire, <laughs> in a way, in this world. Or worse... We're being pelted by blind people (laughs) trying to figure out what's really inside there. And I'm going to test you and figure it out (laughs) with these repeated blows. Merry Christmas, everyone. (laughs) Merry Christmas. To me, it's almost ironic that we would celebrate peace in the middle of December. This holiday season tends to carry with it so much fire and so many lashings, <laughs> if you will. We tend to heap so much pressure onto ourselves with expectations and hopes that are often very unrealistic. And we're often quite disappointed that Christmas doesn't turn out the way we think it should when that inevitable argument blows up within the family or, 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 we go over budget, or, 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 so many, so many pressures that come along with this season, so many expectations. It's good to be in a place where we're here intentionally to remember the purpose of Christmas, that Jesus offers to us and gives to us a peace that is beyond our circumstance, fellow stockings and pinatas, <laughs> take courage, take hope. But how do we get this peace? I'm having you open to Matthew chapter 1 because it provides for us what I think is a very important example of peace to us, and it comes through Joseph. Did you know that Matthew is the only one that records the interaction that happens between the angel and Joseph. Matthew wants to show us something, and I hope we can notice what it is. Would you stand with me as we go to read from Matthew chapter 1? I'm beginning with verse 18, and what I'm inviting us to really notice is Joseph's response to God's calling and the pressure that he's under. Beginning with verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and 
they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now watch this. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. Wouldn't it be great if we always just obeyed? And took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. May God help us also to be so responsive and so obedient. Amen? Please be seated. You know, the book of James references God's word as a mirror. What God says to us, the scripture, is something like a mirror. I think that's a good approach for us as we think about what's recorded in the Bible. That God often wants to show us something about ourselves through the pages of scripture. As Matthew calls specific attention to Joseph. In fact, Matthew addresses Joseph's vision before he talks about Mary. As Matthew calls special attention to Joseph's obedience, I want to ask all of us to take a few moments to really consider Joseph's response and whether or not we could honestly say, yeah, that's what my soul looks like this Christmas. Here's, here's a picture, if you will, of Mary and of Joseph. And to me, it is a picture of a silent night. Wouldn't you agree? It's a picture of serenity. It's a picture of peace. And actually, based on what is said here in the scripture, I think it's not far off. We know that this news, you're going to give birth to a son, and he's going to be named Jesus because he'll take away the sins of the world, is huge news. Congratulations, Joseph. You are going to raise and be stepfather to the Messiah of the universe, of the planet, of this world. Wow. Talk about a change of plans. Think about the pressure that Joseph must have been under as he receives this news. Joseph, no doubt, had reasonable expectations, reasonable plans for his life, don't you think? He was a carpenter. I'm sure he had dreams at some point of opening his own carpentry shop, following in the footsteps of his dad, perhaps. He was engaged to Mary. You know, Mary was probably, because of this culture, probably barely a teenager. Joseph, perhaps only a few years older. He had dreams, I'm sure, of marrying her, taking care of this tax census thing that's required over in Bethlehem, and then returning to Nazareth and perhaps starting a family, having little Josephs and having little Marys. I'm sure that, that something like this must have been in his mind. It's, it's a reasonable guess. Consider how Joseph's life was changed by what we receive as such great news, that God sent his son into this world. For Joseph, it's tremendous news, isn't it? It has such a direct impact on his daily life, his future, his expectations. And isn't it amazing the peace that is reflected in Joseph's responses. So as you look at that image, I'm about to switch it, but as you look at it for this moment, as you look at that image, would this be descriptive of your soul's receptivity to the advent of this season and of Jesus? We know that Jesus did not arrive in this world to remain a baby. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. In this world, we tend to get sentimental and we blush and gush over the little baby born asleep on the hay. It's a soft and tender time. Do we also remember that the advent of Jesus means that my life is now subject to authority, to change? Because Jesus was not born to be gushed over as a baby. He was born to be worshipped as a king. He came to change this world. He came to change us. Two people who knew this immediately because of the revelations of these angels, two people were Mary and Joseph. And their response was just this 
instant obedience. How do we receive peace? How are we going to reflect that in our own lives? I want you to notice three things about Joseph. I want to say that peace comes, first of all, through quiet listening. Have you ever noticed that there is not recorded in Scripture one word that Joseph ever said? It's pretty interesting, I think. What Joseph receives here when he's given this news that you're going to have a son, and what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and you are to name him Jesus because he will be the Savior of the world and forgive sins. When he's declaring that, that is a call to ministry for Joseph. Can you see it that way? I sure do. Joseph, you've got a big job here, and your life is about to be turned upside down. So important that God shows up to tell him what he needs to do in his first words, the angel's words, fear not. Why? Because this is terrifying stuff. For one thing, angels probably signaled you're in trouble. (laughs) The holiness of God is something that, well, I don't even know if I can look at it and live. We don't know what kind of brilliance this angel did. We don't know any of that. But for whatever reason, the angel had to say, don't be afraid, Joseph. I'd be afraid. Do you think he could reasonably expect that the people of Nazareth would understand when they told him, well, this isn't my baby. It's not, it's not that she's pregnant early. It's the Holy Spirit's baby. Do you think that people were going to buy that story? Joseph, in following God's plan, don't be afraid to take her in as your wife. Don't consummate your marriage until after the son is born, etc., etc., etc. In order to be obedient to this calling, Joseph had to sacrifice tremendously. And yet, he offers not one word. Look at Old Testament calls to ministry. How about Gideon? How about Jeremiah? How about Moses? Moses is my favorite, by the way. It's four chapter, four chapters. It's, it's an entire chapter of four objections. God, you've got the wrong guy. I've never been eloquent. What if they don't believe me? Blah, blah, blah. Send Aaron. <laughs> There's a lot of back talk with some of our Old Testament heroes when God calls them to do impossible things. When God, God comes, when, when, he, when his advent arrives with his message of this, this world and your life is about to change and it's going to cost you, man, wait a minute. <coughs> you, I, I'm from the least tribe. You can't possibly want me. You must have the wrong person. And we see these Old Testament heroes objecting over and over. And there's not one word from Joseph. It simply says in verse 24, he did. Wow. What a great statement. Not he said, he did. Well done is better than well said, isn't it, Floyd? (laughs) He did. He simply did. Are we willing to listen to God's instruction? Or are we too focused on our own expectations, our own busyness? Hey, what about the distraction of this season? It's a busy time of Joseph's life. I'm sure he's busy preparing uh, for his marriage, etc., etc. What an inconvenient time for God to break in and to speak to him. What if God spoke to us this week? What if our hearts were quiet enough to hear what God is saying. Many of you have commented on the importance of this season of prayer. How does the mirror hold up to our experience of this Christmas? Are we prayerful? The scripture says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Is there a thing in your life that needs prayer? Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done then you will experience God's peace. How do we receive it? It's often by quieting ourselves. When you're under pressure, are you more likely to talk or to listen? Are you more likely to vent or to receive? Something to think about. God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. Do you suppose you have an answer that God couldn't have figured out? 
His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I look at Joseph as a living example of that. To be able to receive these instructions from God with no word, but simply this note he did, speaks to this issue of readiness, this availability, this quietness about Joseph that I think we ought to notice. Here's a second way we receive peace. It comes through quiet listening, and it also comes through simple obedience. That's what we see in Joseph's life here. It's one thing to hear the message. It's really quite another simply to do it. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Listening and obeying looks a little bit different for you and I. We're not necessarily expecting an angel to show up with a once and for all lifetime announcement but we know that God has given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he'll speak often to us, perhaps through his written word, which we have, scripture. He'll speak to us through other godly people who sometimes say things we don't want to hear. Are we available? And would we be obedient? Could Mark 1, Matthew 1, 24, when Joseph woke up, he did. I wonder if that could be a description for us too. He simply did. You know what the miracle is in this passage to me? The miracle is really, it, it has to do, I think, with verse 19, and then look at, look at verse 24. Verse 18, here's your job. You're gonna, this, is, this is God's calling for you, Joseph. You need to do this. Verse 19, oh, is that verse 18? Let me look. How about I look? Then I'll look a lot smarter. Because some of you are looking, you know. Mary was pledged to be Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. Okay. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, verse 19, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Do you know what the miracle is of this passage? This is a picture, can I say this, men, of a man who had made up his mind and then changed his mind. Is it a miracle? Amen. Three most difficult words in a man's vocabulary. I was wrong. Right? Do you notice that's exactly what Joseph is saying here? By obeying. By obeying. He had already figured out what to do. He had in mind a plan. And God spoke. And he repented of his plan. I don't know about you, but as a guy, and especially... As I get older, I've noticed it's harder to be flexible. And I'm not just talking about in the gym, okay? That's more difficult as well. But it's more difficult to be pliable in my spirit, to be receptive for one thing when I already have it figured out. They say middle age is when a broad mind and a narrow waist trade places. I used to be so open to change and willing to listen. There's something that happens to all of us. By God's grace, I think I'm a little wiser. I know a few things that I didn't know 20 years ago. But at the same time, isn't it true we're still on a journey? Whether we're male or female, whether we're young or old, whether we're anticipating a family or we're anticipating great-great-grandchildren, isn't it God's delight to still speak to us? Wouldn't it be delightful to be free, not to be stuck in our old sinful patterns and instead be open to simple obedience, even if we've messed up over and over and over again? Wouldn't it be refreshing to let God's peace break in to our circumstance, break into our stubborn hearts when we think we already know Simple obedience.
can I make just a couple of notes about God's plans for our life? I think God's plans for our life are generally three things. One, they're bigger than our plan. Sure, Joseph understands the magnitude of the Savior being born. This is the beginning of the New Testament. Could we overestimate the importance of what's happening here? It's so much bigger than opening a carpentry shop, isn't it? God's plans are typically more difficult than our plans. Have you noticed that? (laughs) Yes, we certainly know this is true for Joseph. It's not as if we could offer to you a a more comfortable (coughs) or easy life through obeying Christ. And and we know this throughout Scripture. For Moses, the reason he objected strongly is that things are about to get a lot tougher. And they were. Same thing for Joseph, more difficult. How about always more rewarding, however? The advent of Jesus splits on our calendar B.C. from A.D. It is a new beginning. It is the, the coming of God's kingdom onto this planet. What an amazing thing. Maybe I have too big of an imagination, but isn't it interesting to think about one day in all of eternity, because I think you've got enough time, right? In all of eternity, talking to Joseph about how he felt about this encounter. And, and you don't have his words recorded in Scripture, but that's just my imagination. Think about it. Do you think Joseph would tell you he had any regrets? And I, I, I'm, I can't say with a definitive answer necessarily, and it's really disappointing to some people I can't, but I can't, the issues of predestination and whether or not Joseph could have, could have resisted God's calling here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I don't know. You must be a lot smarter than I am if you have 100% of an answer on this because I read the scripture and say a lot of things both ways. But, if Joseph could have said no, and, and if he did say no, if, if he left Mary, I still think God could have figured out this whole Savior thing, I'm pretty sure. What regret? Because the one day comes for all of us at the end of our lives when we will have a different perspective than we do right now on what it looked like to be obedient and how we want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. I can't imagine Joseph has any reservations about being quietly faithful to this call. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, no mere man has ever seen, heard, or even imagined what wonderful things God has ready for those who love the Lord. Aren't you grateful? What if a simple act of obedience this week could be truly sacramental and change someone's life? What if if our attentiveness in this seven days, instead of just trying to hunker down and get by the holidays and do the next step or whatever it is to opening that carpentry shop or starting the family or whatever, what if if we looked up? What what if we listened? What if God spoke to us and, and what if we obeyed? What if it was something as simple as, as doing something kind for someone next to you. Is that too much of a stretch? What if someone recognized the light of Christ through you, reflecting his peace to them? What if it's someone that really isn't too nice to you <laughs> and you demonstrate this kind of grace to them? I don't know. I suppose that's up to the Holy Spirit to talk to each one of us. He knows who these people are that God is placing in our path to bless and to love this week. What if it makes an eternal difference? Wouldn't that be more rewarding than following our own path? Peace comes through quiet listening. It comes through simple obedience. And I want to say this. It comes through selfless giving. Let me explain that. At the end of the day, verse 25, this passage wraps up this way. It says that he gave him the name Jesus. And this really caught me in reading it. 
he gave him the name Jesus. Parents, would it seem strange to you and unnatural to give your children authority over you? (laughs) In the aging process, this is a reality many times. I'm not saying that's easy, or that that feels natural for any side of the equation. It's difficult to give up a sense of autonomy and independence, isn't it? Now imagine doing that before your child is born and in naming your child, because that's exactly what Joseph does. By giving Jesus the name Jesus, he is identifying his role as being subservient to his son. This is an act of worship, of rightly identifying who this person is that has been born. And I'm suggesting through his obedience, he's honoring God. And he is bowing the knee, and his tongue is confessing well before anyone else. By saying out loud, you are Jesus. You know, at our men's breakfast, something was read that that I've just been thinking about for the rest of the week. And, and the reason I want to share this is because that sounds like really big stuff. And in other words, maybe too far out of reach. We're not called to be Mary or Joseph. <laughs> that, that just happens once. We, we got this clear, right? We're not expecting a, a, a light show of angels and heaven breaking in the same way. We, we understand that. But I want to say that every day we live this week could have eternal significance. What might that look like? Well, looking at the humility of Joseph and his selflessness in sacrificing his plans and his future and in giving the way that he did. I want to read this. It's a a simple devotional. It's written by Ann Cephas, and it's called Helpers Needed. To some people, the term helper carries with it second-class connotations. Classroom helpers assist trained teachers in their classes. Helpers assist trained electricians, plumbers, and lawyers on the job. Because they aren't as skilled in the profession, they might be viewed as having less value. But everyone is needed to accomplish the task. I was thinking about even children's Christmas programs. If you don't want a line in the Christmas program, you offer to be Joseph. You ever notice that? I mean, this guy is supporting cast all the way. Even the innkeeper has a line. Joseph never has a line. And it's actually biblical. Even more than that. Mary is the chosen one. And Joseph, in his obedience and his humility, serves Mary. And unfortunately, I do know a lot about the male eagle. And I wonder if it was cold in the shadow of Mary's glory. Joseph fades off into oblivion. He's not mentioned after this. This is the one appearance. He's visible. He's seen and not heard. I wonder how willing we are to be those people sometimes. Where we don't need the attention. Where we don't need to be the star. Where we support someone else in their dreams. devotional goes on. The Apostle Paul had many helpers in his work of ministry. 
he listed them in his letter to Rome. Chapter 16 is just a whole list of names. He made special reference to Phoebe, who has, quote, been a helper of many and of myself also. Priscilla and Aquila risked their own lives for Paul. And Mary, Paul said in Romans 16, labored much for us. Helping is a spiritual gift, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Paul listed it among the gifts from the Holy Spirit that are given to believers in Christ's body, the church. The gift of, quote, helps is just as needed as the other gifts that are listed. You know, I happened to be by here last night after dark, and there was a certain individual here at our church who is often here, well after dark, in the rain, blowing all the leaves off this campus. Did you notice how nice it looks today? If you want a non-spotlight roll, we now have several piles of leaves along the fences. Perhaps that one person won't be the only one to clean them up, right? It's your chance. We don't have much by way of street lights, so it really will be an in-the-dark thing if you do it after work as he does. But I was so touched by that dear friend because he never asked for the attention. Many perhaps don't even notice. <laughs> Some of us do. <laughs> we're, we're a little too focused on the leaves sometimes. The gift of helps is just as needed as the others that are listed. And then this is the thing that really caught me in the devotional on Tuesday. Get this. Even the Holy Spirit is called a helper. Jesus said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance of all that I have told you. What an honor to be out of the spotlight. What an honor to lower ourselves that he may be raised up. As we prepare to sing a closing song, I'd like to lead us in a prayer. Gracious Jesus, you came as a servant. You deserved to come here as a king and to be reverenced and worshipped and adored and, and rightly identified as the creator of the universe. And yet you came as a baby, born among filth, to a world that would reject you to a world that would accuse you and ultimately kill you on a cross. You came to demonstrate that it is within the nature of God to serve. And oh, how we needed you to serve us by paying the price for our sin that we could not pay on our own. For loving us in advance before we bent the knee or confessed your name. Oh Lord, in this season of expectation, of waiting, of Advent, we honor you today as rightly crowned the king of all kings. One whose love for us is like no one else's love. Lord, whatever barriers keep us from recognizing who you truly are, God, we invite you to take those away. We invite you to speak to us. And Lord, how we long to be instruments of your peace. How we long to be people who might somehow be used of you. Lord, we don't need the credit. 
We don't need the attention. It's so fleeting. It's so temporary. We want to, to cast our service. We want to, to cast the selflessness that you may call us to this week over to you. May others recognize Jesus living in us this week. Help us to be quiet enough and available enough to hear your voice. Help us to be ready to obey. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Would you stand with us for a closing song?